pasión para mi gente Con una pasión Saludos, it's your host, Gabe Morales. As you probably know, I have a lot of family from Texas. My great-grandfather moved there from Mexico just prior to the Mexican Revolution of 1910. My grandmother, grandfather, and father were all born there, and many of the early Washington State Hispanic families were originally from Texas and migrated to the state to pick crops as farm workers. In fact, my grandfather was part of a pre-Texas syndicate group who were active at the Washington State Penitentiary from the mid-1940s to early 1950s. There were some Texas syndicate, TS, in Washington State in later years that I personally knew. And you can catch some of this documentation in my Eastern Washington Latino Gangs episode. I also had a mentor who I worked with at El Centro de la Raza while I was growing up in Seattle in the 1970s named Raul Salinas. He was a poet and former ex-con de Austin Tejas, who would often visit cons at McNeil Island in Washington State when it was still part of the federal BOP. Raul was an associate of the Texas Syndicate when he did time at the Marion BOP facility and was notorious for his poem, A Trip Through the Mine Jail. Texas is the second most populous state after California and the second largest of the 50 U.S. states in size after Alaska. Believe me, it is very big, as I've driven all over it many times. The name Texas derives from Taisha, a spoken word of the Kandon language of the Hasainai Indians, which means friends or allies. Many people there still refer to it as the Republic of Texas, and it is very independent even to this day from the halls of Washington, D.C. After Mexican General Santa Ana's dissolution of the Mexican Constitution in 1824 and its political shift to the right and centralization of the Mexican government, public sentiment among Mexicans living in Texas, as well as Anglos living there, turned towards revolution. Santa Ana's invasion of the territory after putting down a rebellion provoked conflict between 1835 and 1836. The American Texan forces fought and won the Texas Revolution. This happened after the Battle of the Alamo, which took place from February 23rd to March 6th, 1836. And it was a pivotal moment in the Texas Revolution in creating the Republic of Texas. Following a 13-day siege, Mexican troops under President General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana reclaimed the Alamo mission in San Antonio de Bexar, located in modern-day San Antonio killing most of the Texans and Tejanos inside. There were a few Mexicans that fought on the American side against the Mexican government during that siege that few people know about. Santa Ana's cruelty during the battle inspired many Texans and Tejanos to join the Texan army. Due to their desire for revenge, the Texas Patriots de defeated the Mexican army at the Battle of San Jacinto on April 21st, 1836, only about a month later ending the rebellion in favor of the newly formed Republic of Texas with the war crime. Remember the Alamo. Although not recognized as such by Mexico, Texas declared itself an independent nation, and in 1845, it joined the United States, becoming the 28th state when the U.S. annexed it. Only after the conclusion of the Mexican-American War with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 did Mexico recognize Texans' independence. Unfortunately, Texas declared its secession from the United States in 1861 to join the Confederate States of America, and there was slavery in many parts of Texas, as there was a big cotton growing industry there. Texas soon rejoined the Union, but it remained segregated for decades, and discrimination against Latinos was well known. But today, many cities are integrated with diversity, and most people get along. Texas has a rich and popular culture even before the movie Urban Cowboy came out and electronic bull riding became a fad. I was into Tex-Mex Tejano music before it became well known outside of Texas. I often attended bailes that showcased Tex-Mex bands. And yeah, I got my cumbia. We even named our daughter after the famed singer Selena 
before she became mainstream after her untimely death. The history of the state is mainly a mix of Mexican American cultures, but also of other groups. Most people in Texas are good people and law abiding, but there are always exceptions. In June 2022, headlines carried the story of an escaped murderer connected to the deaths of two adults and three children from the Collins family in Leon County, Texas. Authorities stated that Gonzalo Lopez, age 46, was serving a life sentence for capital murder when he escaped a prison transport bus on May 12th between Gatesville and Huntsville, Texas. He was being transported when he managed to break out of his shackles, stabbed a corrections officer, and then fled on foot into a cow pasture and was gone into the wind. Lopez was said to have ties to the Texas Mexican Mafia, and he was killed a few weeks after by law enforcement authorities in a dramatic shootout just south of San Antonio, over 200 miles from where the Collins family cabin was located. Mark Collins was a grandfather, an avid hunter, who passed that passion on to his kids and grandkids, noting that the ranch was where they would often hunt and fish and have fun. The family slaughter was a tragedy and reminded us once again of the brutality of prison gangs. But what was this Mexican mafia and other prison gangs, and how did they start? Before we answer that question, let's go back in time to discuss a brief history of the Texas prison system, then get into the details of all the major FAMAS, or Texas prison gangs. The Department of Criminal Justice came into being in 1848 when an act to establish a state penitentiary was passed by the Second Texas Legislature. The act established a governing body as a three-member board of directors appointed by the governor with the approval of the Senate, and it had plenty to deal with right off the bat. The new state of Texas had a reputation for both lawlessness and law and order. Judge Fantley Roy Bean Jr. was an American saloon keeper and justice of the peace in Valverde County, Texas, who called himself the only law west of the Pecos. According to legend, he held court in his saloon, which was located along the Rio Grande on a desolate stretch of the Chihuahua Desert of Southwest Texas. After his death, Western films and books cussed him as a hanging judge, although he is known to have only sentenced two men to hang, one of whom escaped. Probably one of Texas' most famous outlaws, Sam Bass, is widely regarded to have been a rather inept criminal. Bass's one and only big haul was in September 1877, when he and his gang netted $60,000 in gold from robbing the Union Pacific Railroad train out of San Francisco. Bass died in a Round Rock shootout with the Texas Rangers and the Williamson County Sheriff's Department. A deputy was shot and killed during the melee, and at the time of his death was only 27 years old. Many other outlaws like Bass roamed Texas ranges and towns, and once caught, if not hanged by lynch mobs, many were sent off to Texas prisons, which were known for unsafe conditions and cruelty. The Ruiz versus Estelle case held in U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas in 1980 changed the old tear tender system, whereby staff designated convict bosses in running the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. This change in law created a vacuum, and the prison gangs began to find newfound power. I will come back to that in just a bit. Contrary to what some might think, the Texas Syndicate did not start out in the state of Texas. It actually started out in Calipas. So let's talk a little bit about that development. The Texas Syndicate was first documented in the late 1960s to early 70s. In fact, they are talked about around the time of the shoe war between the West Familia and Mexican Mafia at San Quentin. It is stated that the Texas Syndicate actually sided with the West Familia and some inmates from Maravilla which was a large area of gangs located in East Los Angeles to fight against suppression by the California Mexican Mafia. In 1974, inmates who belonged to the Texas Syndicate created the very first TS logo, or copia, found by authorities, which can be found at the Folsom Prison Museum. As many of you know, I worked at Folsom, and there were several TS housed at New Folsom when I worked it from 1987 to 1993. The ones I met aligned with the Norteño faction, but in some places they were aligned with Sureños. Basically, most TS from Southern California aligned with the Sur. NTS from Northern California 
aligned with Norteños. Of course, the Mexican Mafia controlled the Sureños, and then West Familia controlled the Norteños. The TS was always a small but violent group within the California Department of Corrections. This picture was taken at Folsom Prison in 1974, and the TS remained active there, including in the 4A building, segregation, as can be seen in an interview with an old TS member on the Convict's Perspective channel. It was always a practice for Texas Native offenders who were serving time in California to band together. Consequently, Native Texas inmates Juan Pajaro Solis Vela and Francisco Panchito Gonzalez decided to take this group to the next level and become formally recognized. Original member Tomas Chavez was the only original member not from Texas. He was from Mexico. They established a tip of their own, eight rules that were later expanded, and decided to call themselves El Sindicato Tejano, or the Texas Syndicate. They also decided they would no longer assist a Texas offender just because he was from Texas. They would only take care of their own, made TS members. An official logo or copia was drawn up made of a T superimposed with an S. Inmates who pass a two-year probation period and background check were given the copia. It is believed this design came from Folsom State Prison's East Gate emblem, and the similarities can be seen here. If you have a TS tattoo, you are almost always a member of the Texas Syndicate. If you leave the organization, you must cover it up, or at least one of the letters that indicated you were once a TS member. Today, a TS-specific tattoo is no longer required, or it may be camouflaged due to easy identification by officials. Francisco Panchito Gonzalez was received in the California Department of Corrections on December 14, 1966. He was the TS leader at Folsom, who caused a split in 1983, with some Texas syndicate siding with Naeme and others with the Norse Familia. It is interesting to me that Panchito was moved back to his old stomping grounds at New Folsom Prison, Sacramento County State Prison, in 2016, after he was let out of the Pelican Bay Security Housing Units when many inmates were kicked out of the shoe. He is presently housed at Los Angeles County Prison in Lancaster and is 75 years old. Juan Solis Vela, a.k.a. Pajaro, was also a founding member of the TS who did time in CDC and died in 1984. Today, the Texas Syndicate is virtually unheard of in Califas. Other founding members with Gonzalez and Vela were Juan Caballo Farias, who was housed at the Texas Department of Criminal Justice McConnell Unit in 2018 and was still a leader many years later. There was also Richard Sonny Garcia, Jose Little Joe Miranda, Arnulfo Chango Papi Acosta, Rudy Conejo Gonzalez, Manuel Gus Aguilar, Manuel Chicken Hawk Mendez, and Ruben de Houston Santillana. Some of these TS were sent back to Texas institutions or paroled there after California terms were up, and they organized under the TS banner there. The former head of the Texas Prison Security Threat Group Unit office, Sammy Buentello, was one of our very first International Latino Gang Investigators Association advisors. And he told me, in Texas, there are actually three court cases that helped the TS and other prison gangs thrive. Lamar versus Coldfield, which forced the agency to integrate all cells and cell blocks. Guajardo versus Estelle, which was a court order that gave inmates the right to correspond with anybody, including other inmates inside the prison system, which gave the gangs an advantage in recruiting. And finally, Ruiz versus Estelle, which helped the gangs in their activity as it created a vacuum in the old tier tender boss system. The Texas Department of Criminal Justice or TDCJ, first began to see TS members coming into their system around 1975 to 76. The department did not realize what they're dealing with at the time, and not paying attention to these convicts helped them multiply. The TS established themselves in the system by taking a divide-and-conquer approach. According to TS expert Marianne Denner, there were 12 original members, and in Texas, both Hispanic and white inmates joined together for protection against other inmates. The TS accepted white convict members such as Richard Burrell, Randy Tate, Jackie Cartley, Arnold Darby, and David Green. The TS allowed whites to join until 1995, when some chose to join the Texas Mafia. My good friend Marianne tells us more about TS activities within the state. 
So obviously you already talked talk to us about uh, dealing with gang members and you have appeared on several segments of Gangland for yes, viewers sir. who may recognize Marianne saying, oh, she looks familiar. Yes, she has been in several segments of Gangland. So can you tell us for this segment, Marianne, is there any uh, incident that comes to your mind that, that you still recall today that, you know, was a pretty heavy situation and you weren't sure maybe if, know how that was going to turn out oh there's a lot i think one of them one of them was featured on the gangland the texas syndicate went on the texas terror where the leader had stepped back he'd been the leader for 10 years and he didn't like the way the gang was going the new wave was starting to come in the youngsters mm -hmm. are starting to come in and, and make impressions and and there was favoritism and you know the same problems you have anywhere they were having them too you know and and he said, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this. You know, he would have tried to impose discipline. Well, then one would write out to his homeboy, hey, look what he's doing to me. You know, that kind of stuff. And he got tired of it. So he decided to step back. But he was a real Texas Syndicate member, a yeah. true, true Texas Syndicate member. And he went out to wreck. He, he knew. He'd already told him he'd step back. Yeah. He well, went out to wreck anyway. Yeah. A lot of them get tired of the politics. And, you know, as you know, uh, I work in California, in mm -hmm. the California system. Uh, that's where the Texas Syndicate started, I'll, right. although it uh, then went into Texas. And we hardly hear of the, the Texas Syndicate anymore in, in California. But uh, just for our viewers, no, you know, historical uh, note, it did start there in California by Texas prisoners and then, you know, went back to Texas and then into the federal system and, and all that. So you can look at uh, my book and uh, Marianne helped me out a lot, especially on that Texas syndicate. I appreciate that again, once again, for, for making sure, you know, I was straight because I don't like to put out misinformation and there is well, no. a lot of misinformation out there. In 2003, the Texas court of criminal appeals again, gave convicted killer Raymond De Leon Martinez sentenced to die for a 1983 robbery murder of a Houston tavern owner, another chance to avoid execution. Martinez was described by authorities as being a one-time leader of the Texas Syndicate and was condemned in July 1983 for the murder robbery. Authorities said that he robbed the tavern to raise money to set up a methamphetamine lab and marijuana growing operation. At this time, the TS was running amok on the streets and in prison. In fact, between 1980 and 1983, the Texas Syndicate was responsible for four homicides and numerous assaults inside TDCJ. Between 1984 and 1985, there were 52 gang-related killings. Many of these attributed to the Texas Syndicate in their war with the Mexicaneme, or Texas Mexican Mafia. In 1992, the TS signed a peace treaty with the Mexicaneme, which created a split in the organization. The TS went to war with another prison gang called Raza Nida in 1995, and with the Texas Chicano Brotherhood, from 1998 to 99, and with the Barrio Azteca from 1994 to 96. This happened after the TS declared war with the Barrio Aztecas over a homicide that happened in the El Paso County Jail. At one time, El Paso was a stronghold for the TS. Now it is a stronghold for the Barrio Aztecas. Due to all the differing TS factions, an inmate named Paul Guerra created the Texas Syndicate United, but even that did not last long. Longtime TS member Pablo Villagran and Panchito Gonzalez did not get along. Pablo resented the fact that Pancho was trying to give orders to TS all over the U.S., and especially Texas, when he knew nothing about the federal system or the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Panchito attempted to place control of the federal system TS to Carlos Troca Salinas. This caused a big split within TS in the federal system and in Texas. Troca's followers advocated a peace between the Texas Syndicate and all gangs to include the California Emme, Sureños, Border Brothers, and Hermanos de Pistoleros Latinos, while the majority of Texas Syndicate were at war with those groups at the time. Finally, Troca folded and was no longer considered a factor. There was a lot of confusion within the TS for many years on whether a TS Emme peace treaty was even valid. Pablo Villagran was allegedly related to a California MA shot caller named Black Bob Ramirez. Villagran was also very close to California Aryan Brotherhood members. So some people said he had a 
conflict of interest. T.S. Shot Cover, Gabriel Guero Huerta signed off on a peace treaty with the M.A., along with fellow T.S. Noel Player Lemra and Marion B.O.P., while Guero Shai Shyrock and Raymond Champ Mendes signed it for the California M.A. Danny Aguilar was another T.S. member who was against Pablo's Movidas of making peace with La M.A. de Calipas. Arnulfo Nino was another T.S. Shot Caller who held considerable influence due to his long membership in the organization and for his knack for moving cocaine back in the day. He actually aligned with the West Familia and then VOP, bucking any peace treaty with the California MA. He eventually dropped out and was killed by the Paisas in 2010 in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Meanwhile, Ruben Frosty Rodriguez was another shot caller from El Paso, Texas, who had considerable influence over TS housed at Allenwood in the BOP. But like I said, the TS no longer has the influence it once did in El Paso. TS members are often referred to as being cuernos, which is Spanish for horns, and they will often throw up the index and pinky fingers for the horn sign, meaning TS, and they'll often wear hats of the Texas Longhorns. You have to be careful. It could be just college football fans, or they could be TS. Don't just go by that one thing. TS members of influence were called chairmen or CS, which were seated at different institutions in the state and federal system. It was very much majority rules in the Texas syndicate. And although there have been shot callers, there is no overall central leadership to resolve major disputes as the Mexica Meme have done with their military-like organization. Today, the TS don't have any overall shot callers or CS in the outside world, but they do have lieutenants and captains who report to their designee. They've learned the hard way. They do not want to be easy targets of RICO prosecutions as they have in past years, which is often based on a hierarchy within organizations. Today, the Texas Syndicate is still active all around the state of Texas, and they are involved from everything from murder to mayhem. Texas Syndicates still have strongholds and are heavily concentrated in the following areas of the state. Dallas Fort Worth area, where my family is from, Austin, and Central Texas, as well as parts of Houston. They also have many close ties to local street gangs in these cities. In the past, TS have had females in the organization, but I think most fathers would never want their daughters to be involved in such a dangerous and harmful group. Eli Torres was incarcerated when a terrible mass shooting occurred at Robb Elementary School in Ovalde, Texas in 2022. His daughter, Eliana, was one of 19 innocent killed in that atrocity. Torres was denied a pass to attend his Mijas funeral and was described as being a member of the Texas Syndicate. He seemed willing to blame this fate on his own life's poor choices, which saw him incarcerated for most of his young daughter's life. The choices I made, it cost me, he said. Indeed, joining the Texas Syndicate and other prison gangs caused many people pain and remorse. And we'll continue to show that in subsequent episodes. Until next time, this is Gabe Morales signing off for Gangsters, Cops, and Politicians.